Hey, Ronnie. Hey, Lou. You know, with all the stories in the news about Jeff Epstein, Ooh, yeah, there's a few. Uh, it got us wondering a little bit about some of the things that would be secret that the FBI would rather you didn't know. Oh, there's lots of those things. <laughs> well, on this episode, we're going to share some with you you may not be prepared for. And that's next on Men Are So Smart. Buckle up. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Men Are So Smart. I'm Lou Gallagher. I'm Corvette Ronnie. Nice to be with you. Appreciate you watching today. If you haven't already done so, uh, give our channel a thumbs up, uh, subscribe, and when you do, click that bell. That way you'll get notifications each time a new show comes out, which will be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and now live Bonus. on Sunday. Bonus. Sunday. Sunday. Live episodes. Did you know that you can read Marilyn Monroe's FBI file online, hmm. not to mention your own. Oh. The Vault, an FBI reading room of more than 6,700 documents, contains details of investigations into Marilyn Monroe, Dick Clark, Joe Paterno, wow. Steve Jobs, and many more famous people for everything from music and movies to organized crime. Wow. Thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, if you're curious about the dirt the FBI has on you, you are able to request those files. Dang. Although I imagine a lot of them will re be redacted. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very heavily. Well, especially if there's anything to do with national security. Yeah. So it would be redacted. All right. Good. So today, secrets the FBI doesn't want you to know, Ron. Okay. Even with no arrests... Your fingerprints are probably on file in Clarksburg, West, West Virginia. What? Yep. Uh, if you've ever had your fingerprints taken as part of a background check to, say, get a driver's license, uh, uh, yeah. get a job, buy a gun. Uh -huh. uh, even if the school that my kids went to, if you wanted to drive on field trips... You had to give your fingerprints. Wow. So, yeah. God, that's pretty secure. If right you've done anything like that, and now they have what's called live scan, uh, live scan is directly linked to the FBI's website. If you've done anything like that, then you're probably included. Their database has more than 100 million fingerprints. Uh, it's located in a huge daddy, data campus in Clarksburg, West Virginia. That's about 250 miles west of the main FBI headquarters in Washington. Even with so many on file, according to the FBI, FBI its system can match a set in about 12 minutes. You know what else has over 100,000 fingerprints? My windows on the inside of my car <laughs> from my grandson. <laughs> Secrets the FBI doesn't want you to know. It's not a deal breaker if an agent has a past history of recreational drugs. What? Hmm. Candidates are automatically disqualified if they smoked pot in the last three years or used another illegal drug in the last 10. They've also, they're also dinged for having worse than 2200 uncorrected vision. To become an FBI special agent, candidates must be between the ages of 23 and 37 and successfully complete a battery of physical tests, including a timed 300-meter sprint. Women must run it in less than 65 seconds to qualify. Men, 55 seconds. Disclaimer there. Holy cow. Your mileage may vary. Uh, and push-ups. Women must be do at least 14 and men 30. That doesn't seem right. Hmm. If they have any of the 12 critical skills, including accounting, finance, or law, their application will move to the top of the pile. Yep. Wow. Have you ever given that any thought, Ron? Did you ever think about going into special forces no. investigations? No. They And FBI uses people in accounting. Uh, they use people in law enforcement, so field agents. Uh, FBI has somebody in almost every possible field of work that you can imagine, uh, dealing with cars, uh, dealing with computers. So if you have any type of a specialized skill that could be used to 
investigate a crime, FBI is interested in you. Mm, interesting. Get yeah. your name on the uh, at the top of the list. Get a federal. Get yourself a federal retirement. Yeah. Okay. This next one, criminals on the FBI's most wanted list. They're often chosen based on looks. That doesn't seem right. Yes. Well, you'll get it once I go a little deeper. The most wanted list created by J. Edgar Hoover in 1950 identifies people wanted for kidnapping, murder, theft, and other crimes. But according to the New York Times reporter Michael Schmidt, bureau officials try to select dangerous fugitives who could be recognized by the public because they have distinctive physical uh, features, mm -hmm. such as a scar, multiple tattoos, mm -hmm. or a strangely shaped face. Mm -hmm. So they're putting them out there because you're going to look at a face and it's going to stick. I can look at, we send out these things every day. My sheriff's email has what they call a bolo. It's uh, be on the lookout. Okay. And they're from surveillance videos and they're pictures. Some of them are very good pictures of people. But man, I go through and I rack my brain real quick to see if it's somebody I've dealt with in, in the past that I might, I might have notes on. But if it doesn't, man, it's in and out. Unless they have some kind of a face tattoo that really, like, next time I see that person, I will definitely recognize them. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always wondered, uh, if there's a person who is suspicious, uh, and they have a person of interest, and they have, let's just say, a, a tattoo right here on their arm, Okay. Do tattoo parlors keep track of that sort of thing so that you would go into that place and go, hey, do you have uh, uh, anybody who's gotten a tattoo of an Indian chief? So most times they're going to protect their clients. And if they don't, they'd never do any repeat business. They, they would never, you know, pretty soon word would get around, don't get your tattoos done here okay. because they're straight snitches. And so, but... If you're talking about unbelievably heinous crimes, if you're looking for a mass murderer or a serial killer or, you know, a, a child rapist or something, uh, most will help law enforcement on the down low. So they'll never be identified in court or even in a report that they've helped law enforcement. But... They have in the past uh, at least worked with law enforcement. And uh, tattoo artists sometimes get a bad rap as not being the best citizens in the world. Uh, and you know what? Maybe maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Uh, who's to say? But they're not going to kill their own li livelihood. <laughs> Secrets the FBI does not want you to know that they went digital, but not until 2012 because of computer coding issues. You might think that the Bureau responsible for national security would use the most sophisticated computers available, but until 2012, the FBI was still using paper files to track cases. The group had planned to switch to a new $425 million electronic system in 09, but there were problems with the computer coding. Finally, in August of 2012, Two and a half years later, and $26 million over budget, Woo. the country's premier law enforcement agency began using the new machines. Wow. You would think they would be first on the list. They should have been the groundbreakers yeah. in this whole thing. I don't know. Dang. All right, if you think that one was crazy. The FBI spent one year investigating the song Louie Louie. A year? One year, yep. Uh, I'm sure you all remember the song Louie Louie. Of course. Uh, it was actually written in 1955, but really made popular later by the Kingsmen, and it's been featured in films like American Graffiti and Animal House. I remember them both. Uh, and, oh my God, and college football games and... Every marching band. Yes, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, but it was also the subject of an FBI investigation that ran for more than two years, actually, during the mid-60s. The concern was whether the lyrics were dirty and or pornographic. Ultimately, after spending countless time and money, 
the G-Men determined the lyrics were unintelligible. They couldn't understand them. Yeah. Wouldn't yeah. make any difference anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well. But it took two years to figure that out. Correct. Did you know that they were very, very, and I'll go one more, very suspicious of John <laughs> Lennon? Oh, yeah. Here's one you may have heard. In 1971, Beatles member John Lennon was placed under surveillance by the FBI. Why? You're not going to believe this. Nothing heinous. Hmm? He wasn't a murderer. No. He wasn't a bank robber. But... He was guilty of writing such anti-war songs as Give Peace a Chance. Now, there's a reason. Wow. What a rebel. Yeah. And even songs like Imagine. Oh, my God. Or how about Revolution? Oh. Woo-hoo. Change the world. There's one. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Now, this next one. Interesting. Didn't know this. I'm going to have to. We'll be reading it for the first time together. Walt Disney was an FBI informant. Oh, no. Ooh, Come on. Tell me more, I said to myself. From 1940 until his death in 1966, Walt Disney served as a secret informer for the Los Angeles office of the FBI, according to documents that have come to light under the Freedom of uh, Information Act. The uh, the subject matter was un-American activities, and Disney reportedly gave up the names of several Hollywood people who were suspected of being communists. Oh, yeah, that was a big thing. Yeah, Joe yep. McCarthy. Yep. Uh, he did such a good job. He was named full special agent in charge contact in 1954. Well, you know what? Uh, I guess good on you. You know, I believe in my heart of hearts that Disney in general, was so far ahead of the curve. Oh, boy. That I believe they were using facial recognition back as early as the 60s. I could tell you without question that they are still the largest user of facial recognition. There you go. Right now. I'll tell you what, I don't make this crap up. Yeah, in their parks. And, you know, not only Disney was uh, F FBI informant, what about Ronald Reagan? Oh. Well, I don't remember. <laughs> While president of the Screen Actors Guild in 1947, Ronald Reagan, was designated Source T-10 by the FBI, which meant he was a confidential source with the code name T-10, the New York Times reports. Documents obtained through the Freedom of Information Act, which, as you can see, is very valuable. That's huge indicates that Reagan and his first wife, actress Jane Wyman, provided federal agents with the names of actors they believed were communist sympathizers. Well, that was a big, big thing. It sure was. That was huge. <laughs> yeah, and now we negotiate with the communists. Right, yeah. Or, or they run for president. <laughs> um, so, next one. It took the FBI nearly a decade to locate Dorothy's ruby slippers. They were under the bed. I Why saw somebody them, asked me. I saw them attached to somebody's feet. Oh, under a house. Under a house. Yeah, maybe that's what I was yeah, thinking. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A house had landed on her. They should have looked there. They should have started right there. Uh, again. Yeah. They, I guess they don't know what they're investigating. Whatever. Uh, so, a pair of ruby slippers worn by Judy Garland in the film The Wizard of Oz. Well, she lived a troubled life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these shoes were stolen from the Judy Garland Museum in Minnesota in 2005. Who knew there was a Judy Garland m Museum? I can, think can I get tickets online? They're burying the headline here. Yeah. Um, one of at least four pairs used in the film still in existence. It must... I'm sorry. Excuse me. It must have been important. It took more than 10 years of searching and an actual sting operation... For the FBI to finally locate the purloined pair of shoes. A big shoe sting. That is a shoe sting. Mm -hmm. uh, on our list of secrets, the FBI doesn't want you to know. They don't always play nicely with the CIA. Mm. Among the many con controversies related to the 9-11 attacks is the fact that the government doesn't like to admit that the CIA doesn't always know how to share 
with the FBI. Sharing is caring. It's horrible. We still don't know what happened, Newsweek quotes. One of the FBI's lead counterterrorism agents as saying, he doesn't know what happened. Nobody does. No. It's, a, it's a, a riff between the two of them, and nobody knows why. I will tell you this. Power struggle. Being in law enforcement, the FBI doesn't play well with, I Anyone. don't think, anybody. <laughs> yeah. We go to, uh, I've, I don't know, I've responded to 50 bank robberies, probably, over my course of my career. And most of them are, you just go in and you handle it. Well, bank robbery is a federal crime. And the FBI is looking, they monitor our radio channel, and they're listening for particular cues for serial bank robbers. Oh, uh-huh. okay. And they, uh, they're they never the first one on the scene. We always beat them there. But they, but they always come there and they go, all right, we're taking over now. I see that in the movies. <laughs> they they freaking do exactly. that. Yeah. And I've already spent half an hour interviewing right. the witnesses. Right. And the uh, victims, and we've got our CSI team coming in to fingerprint. They weren't wearing gloves or whatever, and they touched the counter. Uh, we're doing all that, and then they come in and say, eh, we're taking this over. You guys can clear. Yeah, go get a donut. Uh, well, I still have to write a report. Well, you should have enough because we're gonna. we've taken this over. And you are pretty much, you're out of there at that point. And they have some very nice field agents, uh, especially the ones that work bank robbery here. They're 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 nice enough guys, but they will have no problem telling you that button this up as quick as you can. Get your ass out of and here. Be on your way. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. So hey, this next one. Yeah. This may come as no surprise. The FBI, they know if you're lying. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Mm-hmm. Uh, if there's one thing FBI agents can tell about you, it's when you're lying. Uh, at least one 23-year FBI veteran was willing to share uh, her top 10 secret ways to spot liars. So I think I've, I've mentioned in a show before that I went through a 40-hour class on lying. Oh, yeah. I remember we did an episode on it. And how we, how we tell... Mm-hmm. When you're interviewing somebody, if they're lying, and without giving away, and there are things that you can't control. Uh, some of them are, are pretty funny. Uh, somebody may say, you may say, you know, just as general, did you kill that person over there? And they're going to say, nope, I did not. Uh huh. So they can say the words, but their body won't allow them their to. body won't allow them to shake their head no and say no at the same time so it, there are physiological things that you can't control uh I, like that looking up to the left or yes, the right Ron, yes you told me about. yeah so we ask them questions to set up hey in the very first house that you lived in when you reached the doorknob on the front door was it on the right or the left okay well they a lot of times, right-handed people, they look up and left to recall, to get a memory. Or, I do that. Okay? And then, if they're lying about something, they're still they're still remembering, but they're creating. They're, so, the creative side is o- up over here. So, and you'll see their eyes dart back and forth, and that's what trying, they're trying to weave together uh-huh. two the stories. story, yeah. Right. So... Mm-hmm. That is one of the very simplest ways that we can tell when somebody's fabricating. So they know when you're lying, and guess what? Except when they don't. Uh, <laughs> as bright as they are about spotting liars, they weren't able to discern that one of their own, field agent Terry Albury, oh boy, had been betraying national security secrets to the Intercept, which bills itself as adversarial journalism. While Albury claimed he was a whistleblower, just trying to do the right thing. A judge sentenced him to prison for putting the country's security at risk. You know more about that, Ron? Or? You know what? I just remember that he had uh, dozens of, maybe thousands of pages of secret documents that he was handing over to what we 
purported to be enemies. And so it was a huge thing. Mm. It was a big, big thing. Well, how would you think you could get away with something like that? I mean, seriously. You know what? You just get... You hand over something that seems fairly innocuous. Oh. And I think you, they slowly step you up a little bit, start giving you a little money, or I think in his case it was women also. Yeah. Hmm. So... Uh, on kind of that same line, the FBI, although they'd like to think they are, they're not above the law. Yeah. Uh, this one says in October of 2018, and I remember this one too, FBI uh, employees from a number of offices abroad had their jobs terminated following allegations of misconduct, including cavorting with prostitutes. You know, I don't go as far as cavorting. <laughs> I draw the line at cavorting. <laughs> uh, so, a, uh, a website provided information on people whose jobs require a security clearance. Like you. Yes. Uh, and determined that FBI was having this avoidable embarrassment, not only to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, but really to the U.S. government. Uh, it, it really is. That's... I don't even know how to put in words everything I did with the sheriff's department I thought you know what is this worth risking what I what I make it's a pretty good career I made I made pretty decent money but not only that if you get fired your pension is gone Ooh. so is it worth my lifetime pension for this I walked into um, boy this is the greatest example I walked her in, into a home where the person was deceased. And on a card table in his bedroom was laid out probably $50,000 in cash. And he's a dead guy. He had no other family. He was This was a little tiny one-bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. So this guy's probably selling drugs. Um, his death was not suspicious. He probably took a little bit too much of his own product and died that way there would be no kind of connection of that fifty thousand dollars and at least fifty thousand it could have been more uh connecting him to that money but you know what i made more than fifty thousand dollars in a year and i make more than fifty thousand dollars a year in my pension so the instant gratification isn't worth the lifetime of uh, regret. Someone once told me, don't give someone an opportunity to steal from you. I remember what it was, too. I was, uh, I was working at a radio station in the commercial department where, you know, we'd write and, and voice commercials. And I had my own little studio. So I'd come in in the morning, and I'd set my keys down and my wallet and I guess a phone, I don't remember. Um, and... Uh, you know, I'd go about my day, and I'd walk out of my studio and go do something, write a commercial or whatever, and I would leave all my stuff in the studio with the door open. Right. Because that's how I am. I'm trusting. I know myself. I would never be tempted to do something like that. That wallet doesn't belong to me. Right. Uh, I have no business being in it. But see, leaving my wallet there creates an opportunity for someone to have to make a decision. Right. So if you don't create that opportunity, you're not going to do that. But um, at the same time, you probably have known officers who might make that decision. So never let anybody tell you that cops can't be can't break the law. Um, we do unbelie an un unbelievable amount of testing, background investigations psychological testing you have to speak with a psychologist um there's they they put in a lot of work to make sure that the majority of people that law enforcement agencies hire are honest and will do the right thing mm. but among any segment of people mm -hmm. whether they're doctors or lawyers or cops or priests there are a certain amount that are going to break the law. And like I said, we've done an awful lot of screening to try to limit that number. 
but it happens. And, you know, it's just, you can't get away from human nature. If you tempt somebody, uh, they may or may not fall for that temptation and Damn. that's that's how it goes yeah, it has so much to do with so many things your upbringing your social environment um, income level so many things you know i see videos of people walking into a sandwich store and nobody's at the counter there's a tip jar they grab the tip jar and walk out okay uh, probably 99 percent of the time that just wouldn't happen. But it's a it's one of those opportunities where I could either spend eight bucks for a sandwich or I could grab 80 bucks and go get steak and lobster. Mm -hmm. So, Well, one of the other things about the FBI is uh, they know the secrets to successful negotiation, as Ron has kind of alluded to here. An ex-FBI negotiator gave away the number one secret to getting your way in a negotiation, and that, he said, is the power is in patience. You've got to let the other side talk first, and you've got to make them feel in control. Right. Uh, so many times, these guys, they want to tell their story. We had a, we put tracking devices on items, and it's, it's no secret. Uh, we, we use all sorts of equipment, uh, and we usually get bicycles, you know, we use valuable bicycles, thousand dollar bicycles, and we put tracking equipment on it, uh, golf clubs, uh, construction equipment, and we chain it in the bed of a truck and somebody's going to have to go through a little bit of an extra measure to get this out. They can't just walk up and steal it. Uh, because we want it to be a felony. And we have caught people that have their normal, just working stiffs, nine to five working Joe, and they still do it. Uh, it's, you know, I mean, it's hard to say who's going to steal anything, but it, it, there you go. All right, this last one, Ronnie. This one is huge. Boy, this is was in the news. Yeah, and you and I have discussed this before. Ooh, this one is huge right now. Uh, knowing your family tree could cost you your privacy. Uh, if you've ever had your DNA analyzed by a genealogy service, there's a possibility that your DNA profile could be used against you in a criminal investigation. That's how the FBI was finally able to solve the cold case of the Golden State Killer uh, with the help of DNA results from the FBI. So... The Golden State Killer, or the East Area Rapist, as he was known in Sacramento, was the East Area Rapist. Now, he did not actually submit his DNA. Oh, that's right, right, right. This is interesting. His DNA, he was located through a relative of his. Right. And that relative was looking for, and it's a close relative, I can't remember, it might have been his daughter or his niece or something like that, submitted her DNA for to find out her family tree. And inadvertently, bing, we get a hit that, hey, this is DNA found at a crime scene, or it's linked to, uh, they, they call it familial. So which means it's family of DNA found at a crime scene. And they went through and... Up pops a guy that had never been on the radar. Uh, and he turned out to be, he's going through trial right now, so not guilty until, you know, until he's proven guilty. He's innocent right now. But it's him. Didn't they take DNA out of his uh, garbage can? Yes. So what they then did is they set up surveillance on his home. Mm -hmm. He pushed his garbage can out. And they oh, went and retrieved a soft drink. Oh, that's right. Out of his garbage can and did DNA on it and found it's him. Uh, there was just another one that I saw even more recently where they were following the dude. Again, it was through a gene uh, genealogy site. They followed the guy. He went to a fast food restaurant. He 
had a soft drink or a napkin or something and threw it in the garbage can. They picked it up, they ran DNA, 100% match. So, yeah, if, if you've got, uh, you know, if you think if you were a little bit promiscuous when you were a kid, and you not think, me, <laughs> and you think you might have a a son or a daughter out there, Ronnie's and, asking for a friend, <laughs> and and you think you might want to know if you have a son or daughter out there, and you submit your DNA, and your DNA has ever been found at any crime scene, there's going to be a mm -hmm. on your front door. Yeah, but does it ever happen? <clears throat> And I'm sorry, I'm not a scientist, but um, does it ever happen that it turns out wrong? Uh, it could. Uh, your DNA could... Wrongly accused? Yeah. I mean, you, you could easily have your... Your DNA has left a thousand different ways. Uh, every day. Skin flakes and hair and, you know, mm -hmm. coughing up, you know, molecules. Spittle. Anything could leave traces of DNA. Mm -hmm. Um but they usually have a pretty good idea. I mean, they can even narrow down DNA to coming from male or female. And uh, these last two cases, and they really went above and beyond. They've done the extra measures. They have a picture taken of this East Area Rapist one. And this is the biggest one for us because it's, it's right in our backyard. They have pictures of him, the victim uh, pictures. And then you look at his picture because he was uh, unbelievably, he was a police officer That's right. uh, during the time that these rapes and murders were happening. And you look at the picture, his police picture from back then and the suspect pictures, a dead match. Wow. It's a dead flipping ringer. So. Well, we hope that you've learned something today. Uh, the FBI. Yeah, they keep some secrets. They don't really want you to know. Yep. Um, if we're not doing this show on Friday... You'll know. You'll know why. Right. Tell my wife I loved her. <laughs> Taking us out. <laughs> we're at Guantanamo Bay or something. All right. Well, we hope you've enjoyed it. Maybe even learned something today on the program. If we did, we've done our job. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please be a subscriber to our channel. And when you click that button, uh, click the bell next to it. That way you'll get notifications each time a new show comes out. Our shows come out on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 6 a.m. Uh, Pacific and 9 a.m. on the East Coast. Plan accordingly. Uh, and then we also have a live show that we do on Sunday mornings called Sunday Morning Mass. Bonus. If you haven't already done so, check out our website at menaresosmart.com and find us on Facebook at Men are so smart. I'm Lou Gallagher. Corvette Ronnie. We'll see you, if we live that long, on the next Men Are So Smart. We'll see.